Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, uh, please introduce Sam Geyer. Sam is a postdoc at the University of Texas working with Catherine McKinley. Uh, he finished his PhD thesis last year working with Calvin Lynn. Uh, for his PhD work, he looked at uh, high level optimizations for software libraries, um, focusing mostly on like, the scientific community. Uh, Sam has recently been in terms of using uh, program analysis to assist garbage production and the development of subjects in stock today. Thanks, Dave. All right. Well, uh, thanks for coming. Um, all right. I guess let's go then. So uh, I'm going to talk mostly about pointer analysis in this talk and two different applications. So let me start just with the high-level motivation here. Uh, so what is pointer analysis? Well, for languages like C, C++, Java, and C Sharp, um, the goal of pointer analysis is to determine pointer targets at compile time. And this is an important problem for a lot of applications. Obviously, for optimizations, you need to know about aliases. And then there's many other applications that can use this information, program slicing and understanding, error checking, and now also uh, object-oriented optimizations, such as object inlining and synchronization removal. So what's the problem? Pointer analysis is really hard. So uh, it's undecidable in general. And so there have been many, many approximations of pointer analysis. So there's, uh, at one end of the spectrum, there's near linear uh, by Bjarne Steensgaard, who's right here, um, but fairly imprecise. And then perhaps at the other end of the spectrum, you have uh, shape analysis by uh, Muli Sagib and company. And that, I think, is double exponential in time. So huge spectrum of cost and precision. And um, there was actually this survey paper by Michael Hind a couple of years ago called Haven't We Solved This Problem Yet? And which sort of expressed this uh, huge range of different uh, approaches. And I think part of the problem is that there's just no one algorithm that satisfies all needs of all the uses of pointer analysis. And this is especially true for this trade-off between the cost and the precision of the analysis. So an approach now that a lot of people are using is, uh, is to recognize that pointer analysis is not a standalone task. You don't just compute pointer analysis just for fun. Um, it provides pointer information to client analyses, whether they're optimizations or error checkers. And you really can't evaluate what you need in terms of pointer analysis without looking at what that client is. So there's, there's this common metric, points to set sizes, that people use. And you try to get this number as low as possible. But it's not clear whether that really helps whatever it is your particular application is. And so I think what we need to do is stop trying to solve the pointer analysis problem in isolation. Instead, we need to recognize that it's really a family of problems. And what we should do is take into account exactly what the client needs from pointer analysis. And then evaluate the algorithm directly in terms of how it benefits the client. And We'll customize the algorithmic features for the client, hopefully automatically if we can. And I'll show one approach that does that. So here's the outline of the talk. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about one application, compiler-assisted garbage collection. And what's interesting about this pointer analysis is that it's fast, it's simple, and it's not sound. And then after that, I'll talk about a pointer analysis for error checking that analysis automatically adjusts its precision to the needs of the error checking problem. All right. So compiler-assisted garbage collection. So this work was done in the context of Java, which is sort of a C-sharp-like language. Um, and uh, so in these languages, uh, they all require garbage collectors. And most of the modern garbage collectors use multiple spaces. So for example, uh, a common configuration is a generational collector. So it has a nursery space. You allocate all your new objects in the nursery space. And it turns out that a lot of objects die young. So this is the so-called 
generational hypothesis. And that means that collecting the nursery space is cheap. So we can do that frequently to reclaim memory. And then we copy the survivors into the mature space in this process called promotion. So what's the problem with that? Well, longer lived objects are always copied. That is, if we have some big data structure, um, we still have to funnel it through the nursery. Um, if you look at the uh, spec JVM 98 benchmarks, for example, the Java C benchmark, depending on your configuration, can copy as much as 25% of its memory through the nursery. So that's almost 50 megabytes out of 185 megabytes. All right, so how can we avoid promotion? Well, the, the obvious solution is just skip the nursery. So allocate objects that will survive directly in the mature space. Uh, but we need a way to predict which objects are going to survive. And the way to do this is to look at why objects survive. So one way they survive is pointers from the stack. So some variable in the program is still using uh, an object. So obviously that's an object we still need, and that'll survive. But another way it happens is pointers from the mature space into the nursery space. And since we're only collecting the nursery, we have to assume that those pointers are still alive. And so that'll cause those objects to survive. And it turns out that most objects survive because they're connected to older objects. Again, for Java C, of the objects that survive nursery collection, 10% are pointed to by stack uh, pointers or variables, and 90% survive because they're pointed to by the older space. Yeah? None. Since we're only collecting the nursery, anything connected to an older object will be promoted. So I'm talking about the numbers that you have. I'm not sure I understand So your hypothesis will be that if something is linked to an older object, you will allocate it into the mature space. Mm -hmm. But it may very well be the case that if it was allocated into nursery, it did not... Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll get to a lot of the details later. Yeah, I'll show you a lot of the corner cases and stuff like that. Okay, so, um, so how can we take advantage of this? So... Uh, the, what, what's going on is that the pointers between the spaces are, pre, are the predictors of survival. So if we create a new object in the nursery, point to, to it from the mature space, that new object will be promoted. Right? So here's the situation. What we, what we really should do is anticipate the existence of that pointer and allocate the pointer target in the same space as the source. We call that co-location. And so... You know, that's sort of the picture we're looking for. So here's the system we implemented. Our approach is called dynamic object co-location. And the key is it's a cooperation between the compiler and the runtime system. So on the runtime side, we have a new allocation routine called coalloc. And coalloc takes an extra argument of type object, which we call the co-locator. And at runtime, it looks at what space the co-locator resides in, and it allocates the new object in that same space. And then the compiler's job is to determine whether those new objects will be pointed to by some other object. And then at the allocation site, it'll pass the pointer source as the co-locator. And as a result, together, this will cause connected objects to end up in the same space. So let me first show just a simple example of what it is we're trying to do. So here's a method called simple. It takes a parameter P of type A. It creates a new B object, and then it stores B in P.F. So it kind of creates a little uh, object graph that looks like this. And because of that pointer, we can deduce that the new B object will live at least as long as A since it's pointed to by A. And I've got a little caveat asterisk here that I'll come back to. So what we'll do then is replace the call to new with a call to coalloc, and we'll pass P as the co-locator. Now, the nice thing about this is that it's the runtime value of P that determines the behavior of the coalloc routine. 
So what that means is that if P happens to point to an object that's in the mature space, then the new object will go in the mature space. If P points to an object in the nursery, then the new object goes in the nursery. And that'll just be determined at runtime at every single call. Yeah? So in this example, supposing if before the new B, P was redefined into something else. Like this? <laughs> or something like that. Right. Yeah. OK, so, that, so that's the big caveat, right? So this, this works great unless P dot F or P is overwritten with some other value. And I'm going to come back to that just in a little bit. But let me just finish with, with this first. So um, the other nice thing about this is that it works really well for reusable code. Because what it means is that each time you use a method, it, um, it does the right thing in context. So for example, if you were adding elements to a linked list, if the list is in the older space, new elements of the list will go in the older space. If the list is in the, mature, in the nursery space, new elements go in the nursery space, which is sort of the behavior you want. And also, and also you don't have to make a static decision about that at, at compile time. All right, here's a slightly more complex example. So here we have uh, an, a method with an argument P of type A. We create a B object. We create a C object. We point to B from C, and we point to C from A. Now the problem with this is C can't be the co-locator for B, because it doesn't exist when B is created. So the way we solve this problem is we can just use P as the co-locator for both of those new objects. The reason is, since connectivity is transitive, um, survival is also transitive. So both B and C will live at least as long as A. Again, with the caveat that the pointers are sort of stable pointers. And actually, this really simplifies the task of finding co-locators. OK, so here's what we're looking for to find co-locators for allocation sites. So first, we'll always use formal parameters of methods as co-locators. Um, for one, they're more likely to refer to old objects, especially certainly older than objects that are created in the method. And then the order in which objects are created and connected in the method won't matter. We won't have to worry about which things are created before other things. So our goal is, for each allocation site, we want to find out, will the new object allocated at that site eventually be connected to one of the formal parameters, either directly or through some chain of pointers? And we can compute this using a customized pointer analysis. So it'll determine the connectivity using a points to graph. So here's basically how the algorithm works. It's very simple. I can show essentially the whole algorithm on one slide. So we analyze one method at a time. And we start out with a node for each parameter. So here I have a method foo with parameters p and q. And then we add a node for each allocation site in the method. So there's some number of allocation sites. And then edges in this graph will represent possible pointer relationships between these objects. And then we go through the internal representation of the method. So this is just the compiler's IR. We keep track of how variables point to those objects. And so this is Java. So at a put field or an array store, we'll add edges between the appropriate objects. So there's some connectivity at the end of the analysis between the, the objects. And then what we can do is we can just search the graph to test reachability of the allocation nodes from the parameters. So for example, here, um, the new E object is reachable from the P parameter. So P is probably a good co-locator for E. So there's several interesting features of this analysis. Um, and they all sort of come out of the following observation. And that is that allocation decisions uh, don't affect the correctness of the program. So as a result, this co-location analysis need not be sound. Um, one way we exploit that is just to simplify the algorithm. So unlike a lot of other analysis algorithms, 
we just do one pass over the code. We don't compute a fixed point at all. And then a second thing we can do is sort of dispense with a lot of conservative assumptions. So for example, as you saw in the previous slide or may have noticed, we assume that parameters don't alias each other. The second thing we can do is dispense with the so-called closed world assumption, which is used in a lot of pointer analyses for Java. Did you, you have a question? Oh, okay. Um, so our algorithm will work with dynamic class loading, reflection, and native methods. Um, the analysis won't understand what those things do, but it also won't break the program if they're there. And then finally, now here's, here's where I deal with the, the caveat. Um, there are some cases where uh, pointers are sort of volatile. And in those cases, we're going to try and detect them and skip those connections. Again, that makes the analysis unsound because it's missing possible pointer relationships. So let me talk a little bit more then about that. So as I said, some connections shouldn't cause co-location. So if you keep overwriting a field with new objects, you don't want to co-locate them. What will happen if you do is you'll fill up the mature space with garbage. So what we'll do is prune them out of the graph with heuristics. So here's an example. Um, so this method creates a string. It then looks in a container to see if the string is there. And if it's not already there, it adds it. The problem with that is that the store of the object is conditional on this containment property. We don't know how frequently that branch is going to be true or false. So as a result, we'll skip that connection. So the heuristic here is we'll require that the store of an object has to post-dominate the uh, creation of the object for the, for the compiler lingo there. Uh, here's the second heuristic we've developed. So in this method, um, we fill a container with a bunch of new objects, but then we immediately clear that container. So those objects are only sort of tran uh, uh, are only in their trans sorry uh, transiently. That's it. Damn. Thank you. Transiently. So uh, the heuristic we've developed to detect that is that connections that have null assignments shouldn't be used for co-location. And that's, we sort of view that as a hint from the programmer that that, that field is not going to be stable. So finally, uh, there is an interprocedural component to our analysis. And the reason is that in many cases, the allocation and connection of objects don't occur in the same method. The typical case is for containers. So you create a new object, and then you call some method to add it to the container. The problem is the, if the analysis doesn't know what that add method does, then it won't see that those objects are connected. So what we do is, first, for such connector methods, when we're analyzing them, we record a very simple, simple summary that describes how objects get connected inside that method. And then at each of the call sites, we can apply that method summary so that we can see those connections. The second case is factory methods, which are just methods that generate objects and return them. Again, we can detect when a method is a factory method. And then at the call site, we'll basically just treat it like an allocation site. Yeah. So what do you do? How do you identify connector methods and factory methods? Do they have to be annotated? Or? No, no, that's during the analysis. Okay. So, so as so that's a that's a byproduct of the analysis. Pre pass. Hmm? You do that as a pre pass, figuring out which methods are connected methods and factory methods. Uh, what we're currently doing is we are preferring to analyze methods bottom up in the call graph. Again, it's not. Okay. It's convenient. Um, that seems to produce. There's a bunch of different approaches. I mean, you can analyze libraries ahead of time because those are the most common uh, cases where you need this information. But again, you know, it's it's because of because we're sort of free of the soundness requirement. If we have the interprocedural information, it's great. If not, we just miss out on those opportunities. So if you do this bottom-up call graph thing, you can actually 
have a connector method that calls another connector method that calls another connector method that, that actually gets treated correctly? Or are you only yes. dealing one, with one level? We're, well, um, it will work. The information will pro propagate properly up the call graph. Okay. We don't have we don't handle things like recursion because there's no iterative uh, analysis. All right, so uh, here's the experiments we did. So we implemented this system in the Jikes RVM using MMTK, which is a toolkit for building memory managers and uh, garbage collectors. We applied this technique to two generational collectors. Um, both of them we configured with a four megabyte um, nursery. So gen copy is uh, a generational collector with a copying older space, and gen MS has a mark sweep older space. We compile all the methods for the benchmarks ahead of time. So this is what I was referring to earlier. Compile all the methods bottom up ahead of time. Uh, and the benchmarks we're using are the spec JVM 98 benchmarks, plus a version of the spec JBB benchmark that's been modified to have a fixed uh, workload. And the primary goal here is then to redu reduce the cost of nursery promotion and therefore reduce uh, garbage collection time. At the same time, though, we need to avoid filling up the mature space with garbage. Otherwise, that'll cause excess full heap collections, which are very expensive. All right, so here's a graph showing the amount of memory that survives nursery collection. So uh, across the uh, across the x-axis are the benchmarks. For each benchmark, there are two uh, two columns here. Um, the one on the left is for the base system, and the one on the right is for the system with colocation. And the number here is the number of megabytes copied. And the way the graph um, is shown here is it's actually normalized to the amount copied by the baseline version. So what you can see here is that uh, co-location is reducing nurse nursery survival by at least 50%, sometimes more in other cases. Um, but you remember, we have to allocate some stuff in the mature space. So the component that I've added here is the amount of memory that co-location causes to go directly in the mature space. So if the system's working perfectly, the blue bar will go low, but the, the sum total of the blue and the yellow bar won't exceed 100. That means it's making the exact right decision about which objects to put in the mature space. And for most of the benchmarks, it's doing pretty well overheads of just a couple of percent. Um, so Jess is a, one of the cases where it's not working very well, but if you look at the in absolute terms, there's only two megabytes surviving collection in the Jess benchmark, so there'd be very little to gain here anyway. Um, so for JBB, or what we call pseudo JBB, um, it's pushing the nursery survival rate down pretty low, but it's still putting a lot of extra stuff in the older space. So in larger heaps, that's fine. We get a good performance improvement. In smaller heaps, though, that, that does actually hurt us. It can uh, increase GC time. Java C is one of our best results. We push the nursery survival rate down by about 60 or 70 percent, and with only a couple of percent objects being incorrectly um, placed in a mature space. So here's how that affects GC time. Um, so this graph is showing on the x-axis axis, a range of heap sizes, and on the y-axis it's showing garbage collection time. And the red and yellow lines are the base system, and the two blue lines are with co-location. And so for the mark sweep collector, it's about a 62% reduction there out in those heap sizes, a 57% reduction for gen copy. Um, and that about corresponds to the amount of nursery uh, promotion that we're avoiding. So here now is garbage collection time 
uh, in terms of speed up averaged over all the benchmarks. Again, over a range of heap sizes, so you can see that the two co-location uh, systems are improving GC time by anywhere from 10% in the smaller heap to, uh, that's 28 and 31% in larger heaps. An interesting thing about this graph is that the shape of the graph for gen copy of gen MS, um, the graphs have almost the exact same shape, except the gen MS has shifted back um, about 50% or so. And the reason for that is that gen copy, because it has a copying older space, has to reserve half of that older space. So mistakes we make putting things in the older space hurt us sooner. Gen MS can actually use the full capacity of that older space, and so the mistakes hurt us um, a, lot, a lot later. Okay, so that's uh, compiler-assisted garbage collection. I guess if you've got any questions about that before I move on. <laughs> so JBP is one of the you know, more interesting benchmarks in this one. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have, you don't have a, slot, a slide that describes the speed up for JBP? Just for JBP? Yeah. I have the graph, you know, I should have just stuck all those graphs in here and I didn't. What happens is that there's like a crossover point. Um, in smaller heaps, like uh, one or 1.5 times the minimum heap size, co-location is not doing as well as the baseline system because it's putting a lot of extra stuff in the mature space. But it doesn't take very long to get past that. At maybe 2x the minimum heap size, co-location is already beating the baseline system. Yeah, there's actually a, a couple of ideas we're working on right now to collect better information at runtime um, and make that decision a little bit smarter. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to kind of shift gears and talk a little bit about some work that I did uh, as part of my dissertation. And here, again, we're using pointer analysis, but we're using it for error checking. And instead of Java, we're in the C world. And for these problems, high precision is actually needed in many cases, but only in certain parts of the program. And so I'm going to describe an analysis that automatically adjusts precision to those needs. So. Um, so here's how pointer analysis is typically used in error detection systems. Um, so you have an error detector that you develop, and you realize that you need pointer analysis. So you add this pointer analyzer thing on the front. And uh, you typically have to choose some level of precision ahead, ahead of time. So um, you might choose from these common uh, configurations. Uh, context and flow insensitive, that would probably be the cheapest, the fastest. You might have a flow sensitive analysis, or you might have, you know, context and flow sensitive, very precise, but probably very expensive. And uh, here's the problem. Here's what happens. So I actually did this experiment. Um, so let's say we want to check for some error like a security vulnerability. And I grabbed this um, open source program called Black Hole off the, off the net. It's a mail filter program. And uh, so what I do is I start out with the cheap analysis. That's kind of the obvious thing to do. Uh, it runs really fast. And it comes back and tells me that there are 85 possible errors in this program, 85 security vulnerabilities. Well, you know, this is a pretty widely used program, so I'm, I'm suspicious about that. I, I don't think there are 85 vulnerabilities in it. So I dial up the precision a little bit. So I add flow sensitivity to my analysis. So uh, for that, it runs 25 times slower and gives me the exact same answer. Um, all right, so I'm a pretty patient guy, right? So I dial up the, the precision to the next level context sensitive, flow sensitive, and then the thing just like runs out of memory, blows up, and I get no results at all. So then what I do is I go back 
I manually inspect these 85 errors. It takes days and days. And what I notice is that uh, they all have one thing in common. They all use this common string processing routine. And so kind of on a hunch, I, uh, I create a clone of this routine for every place where it's called. So I'm in effect, I'm sort of adding this ad hoc context sensitivity to the program. Then I rerun with the cheapest analysis, and now it reports there, there are no errors in the program. So all 85 of the error reports were false positives. So the question is, is there some way to do this automatically? Motivation. This cloning of the one magic procedure that makes all of the false positives go away. And... Question? Yeah. So what are the kind of errors that you're looking for? Um, I don't have a... I don't have a slide describing all of them. They are all... Um, well, I'll talk specifically about one of them. But they're all common errors that um, have been used in the literature, like making sure that file handles that are opened are subsequently closed, um, looking for format string vulnerabilities. Um, and I'll describe another one here in a, in a couple of slides to give you a, a more concrete example. But, so we looked at five different error checking problems as well. Okay, so. Uh, the, the reason that this is a problem is we have this really severe cost-benefit trade-off for pointer analysis. And our choices were just too coarse. We sort of had cheap and imprecise, expensive and basically useless. And we, we sort of have to make this choice ahead of time before we even see the programs or the problems that we're going to be solving. So our solution is a mixed precision analysis. That is, we'll apply higher precision only where it's needed in the program. And we'll use the really cheap analysis elsewhere. And the key is, we'll let the client, that is the error checking problem, drive that decision. So we'll create a customized precision policy during the analysis just for that problem. So here's how the algorithm works. We start with the really cheap analysis. During that analysis, we monitor how information gets lost as a result of that imprecision. We store that information in a dependence graph, and then we create a customized precision policy just to address those problems. Then we rerun the analysis using that customized precision policy. So let me first describe just a little bit about the framework. So the framework solves both the pointer analysis and the client analysis at the same time using iterative data flow analysis. So for pointer analysis, the flow values are points two sets. For the client analysis, they're actually these type state values, which are commonly used for error checking problems. And by solving them together, we can actually monitor their interaction as well. The second feature is we support fine-grained precision policies. So we can choose context sensitivity on a per procedure basis, and we can choose flow sensitivity on a per memory location or per variable basis. And that'll allow us to compose these custom precision policies. Okay, so here's sort of the key part, is how we build those policies using this monitor, the monitor and the, what we call the adapter. So what does the monitor do? Okay, well, before I get into that, let me, let me look at how, how these false positives actually occur. So what is, it, what is the problem we're trying to solve? So uh, here's an example of a security vulnerability that we actually check for. And we call this thing a remote access vulnerability. So if you look at this code, it creates a socket, it reads from a socket, and then it calls this exec L function. And, uh, you know, this is like your system administrator's worst nightmare here because basically you're just reading something off the, you know, you're reading from a socket and just letting whoever wants to execute a program on your machine as you, they can do that. Um, so that's a pretty bad security vulnerability. So we'd like to detect this automatically. And the problem is, you know, it's rarely this easy to spot such a vulnerability. What really happens is you have a large program and these calls are spread all over the program. 
so here's a call graph with calls to socket and read and exec. And let's say, OK, here's a path through the program that has that vulnerability. So that's what we'd like to be able to detect. Does that happen in the program? The problem is there could be a different path through the program. Let's say this one. So here I read from standard in um, you know, the console. And let's just say you know, it's OK for someone sitting at the console to issue a command. Let's just say that's OK. That's not a security vulnerability. So what happens when we analyze those, particularly with context insensitivity? So we have these two paths that merge at a commonly used procedure. So you know, we're data flow analysis people. We like to grab our handy lattice. And so we've got an error path and a no error path. And we're forced to merge these into this kind of ugly maybe error path color. And then that information propagate, propagates back to both calls to exec L. So now instead of one error, what we've got is two possible errors. So how does the, how does the monitor detect this? It runs alongside the main, uh, the main analysis during that analysis. And it's looking for two things. First, it's looking for what we call a polluting assignment. So that is an assignment that before the assignment, we had two precise um, analysis values, like red and green. And then for some reason, we were forced to merge them into that yucky yellow color. And then it tracks complicit assignments. So these are assignments that just convey that approximate maybe error value to other places in the program. And then we record all that information in a dependence graph we do that for both the pointer and the client analysis. So taking a closer look then at how we build this dependence graph. So if you look at the two cases that we handle for polluting assignments, so if you have context sensitive analysis and you've got this function foo, you can have foo of green called in one place and foo of red called somewhere else. And as a result, the formal parameter will be yellow. Or alternatively, in the flow insensitive case, you could have multiple assignments to a variable, x equals green, and then later x equals red. And as a result, the variable x will get that yucky yellow color. So what we do is we create a node in the graph for those variables. And then we annotate them with a sort of diagnostic. And the diagnostic tells us, what do we need to do to disambiguate the value of that variable? So for the formal parameter there, you can see if I need param to be more precise, what I need to do is make foo context sensitive. And similarly for x, if I need to make x more precise, I need to make it flow sensitive so that I can keep track of those separate values. And then for complicit assignments, so if I have an assignment x equals y, where y was yellow, therefore x is yellow, I just add an edge between those two nodes. And the edge points backward along the assignment. And the reason is that's going to let us get from the place where the approximate value caused the problem back to the source, back to the original polluting assignment that created it. Now, there's one other interesting way in which these ambiguous values can happen, and that's indirect assignments through a pointer. So if you have a pointer dereference like this, x equals star pointer, and the result is x is maybe error, that can happen in two ways. One is the target has this polluted value. So pointer points to y. That, in effect, is just saying x equals y. So we just treat that exactly as we would x equals y. But the other way that that can happen is that the pointer itself is ambiguous but the targets of the pointer are precise. So in this case, what we'll do is, in effect, we'll blame the pointer for the problem. We'll say that if x needs to be more precise, what we have to do is fix the precision of the pointer. And this is one of the ways in which the error checking analysis can interact with the pointer analysis. OK, so now what? So at the end of the analysis, we've got this dependence graph keeping in mind that so each node is a variable, and the edges sort of point 
in a sense, backwards in the execution. So we start at the variables that caused these uh, possible errors. So the inputs to exec L. We start at those variables. And then we find all the nodes reachable through that dependence graph. And along the way, we collect all of those diagnoses that are annotating the nodes along the way. And then that becomes our new precision policy. So in effect, that's going to be all of the things we needed to do that would affect the final values of those variables. Yeah? No. Because there's other ways in which that, there's other things that we don't handle that can cause that imprecision. It's not guaranteed. Yeah. What do you do? What do you do if a pointer can point to a red and a yellow? So both, both the pointer pollutes and the sub pointer is pollute. Yeah, in that case, we consider that to be, well, we would have both, we would do both things. We would, we would have the pointer and the, ver and the pointer target. Both of those things would be disambiguated, or we'd try to. The nice thing about this is that this precision policy is often a very small subset of all the imprecision that actually occurs in the program, at least in general for these error checking problems. All right, so here's my, this is sort of my homage to PowerPoint here. This is the uh, algorithm in action. So here was, our, here was our problem before. The, during analysis, the monitor detects the polluting assignment. We diagnose and apply this fix, which is to clone that common procedure. And now when we analyze, we're not going to mix the two paths. So we'll get the one true error and the other error will go away. All right, so the experiments we did here, we downloaded uh, 18 real C programs, totally unmodified from open source projects. And so they've got all the nasty things that uh, re production code systems have. Uh, many of them are system tools, so they run in privilege mode, meaning that it's going to be important to find security vulnerabilities. We looked at five different errors that are all variants of uh, type state error checking. Um, they all represent fairly non-trivial program properties. And they're all problems that stress the pointer analyzer. And then we compared our client-driven algorithm with some commonly used fixed precision algorithms, which I've already described. And the way we compare these is, first and foremost, we want to reduce the number of errors that they report. Um, these are all conservative, uh, sound analyses. So by reducing the number of errors, we're always reducing the number of false positives. Sec and then second, if two algorithms produce the same number of errors, then clearly we want the fastest of those two. All right, so here's the giant results graph. So here I'm showing the results for that remote access vulnerability that I showed you before. Along the bottom are the 18... Um, programs that we looked at, I've ordered them in terms of increasing number of CFG nodes, which is sort of a measure of the internal representation size. And then along the y-axis is analysis time, and it's normalized. And it's normalized towards the fastest analysis mode, which is the context insensitive, flow insensitive. And what I've done here is, with each of the points, the number is the number of errors reported using that precision level. All right, so here's what happens as you boost up the precision. So there's the flow sensitive version. So uh, you can see that uh, in some cases it does actually help. For some programs it does help to increase the precision, but for many it doesn't. But for all programs it increases the analysis time, sometimes by two or three times, sometimes as much as 25 times. Here's kind of an unusual combination, context-sensitive, flow-insensitive. So here it really gets a lot more expensive. Um, those triangles at the top are basically things that it either took an excruciating amount of time or ran out of memory. And then finally, as you can imagine, context-sensitive, flow-sensitive. Um, for many of the programs, we just, we just don't even know. Yeah. So, 
the numbers. If what? Oh, to show you just, well, they're not, it's not a strict hierarchy, right? You can't compare, you can't compare context sensitivity with flow sensitivity. So it's not. And that's how I also got confused there since it was like on WUFTP. Yeah. It's 15 and then going to 28, but then they are incomparable. Yeah, that's the, right. Okay, so here's, here's the punchline. So there's the client-driven al uh, algorithm. So the thing to notice is that for the most part, in terms of cost, it's sort of in between the cheapest and the next cheapest, the, the flow-sensitive uh, algorithm. But uh, you can't see here, but it always achieves at least as low or lower number of false positives than any of the other algorithms. So it always meets or beats any of those algorithms in terms of precision. So here's some interesting cases. So for this program, there are no errors of this type. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about that is we run that first pass. There are no errors, so we're done. There's no point expending any more energy trying to uh, you know, use those higher levels of precision. And then here's black hole, so you can see the client-driven algorithm reports no errors, and it is in fact finding that procedure that I found by hand and making that one context sensitive. All right, so here's sort of the, yeah. So on, back on the previous slide, can you tell me what the numbers are again? Are they false positives or are they just we, False and real positives. They're both combined. We, okay. we didn't go through and find the true number of errors in all these programs. It's, obviously, it's very hard to do that. I suspect, for example, that, you know, there, I suspect that there are not 80 or 90 vulnerabilities in that program. Um, but again, it's, the difficulty of finding the true number of errors um, is prohibitive, especially if you want to do a large number of programs. We're just you know, lower is better, that's our, <laughs> yeah. So, so for any one particular column, what does the green mark mean? Green star, the prime what, what is the what? The green star? Yeah. Is the time, because time is on the y-axis. No, no, so, so, yeah. so what kind of analysis is this doing, client, this client driven? That's our adaptive analysis. So, doing the same, so, but when do you stop? When do you stop this adaptation? Because oh, it's one time. You just do one. Just one. Okay. It's not a. It's not an iterative algorithm. It just does. It just does a one time. We actually experimented with that, doing further iterations and further refinement, and we found that it's better to be a little bit overly aggressive about adding precision rather than letting it iterate multiple times. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good So, um, in conclusion, I think, you know, it, it, it seems clear to me, and I think a lot of other people seem to agree, that, uh, you know, different algorithms for pointer analysis are needed in different situations. And I think, you know, we, we should probably just stop looking for the one perfect algorithm uh, for pointer analysis. One way to do this is to sort of challenge the assumptions that a lot of people have been holding. So. Uh, earlier I showed you analysis that doesn't need to be sound um, and you know precision is that a fixed property of the analysis maybe it's not maybe you adjust it and then uh, for future work I think I'm going to continue working on this sort of compiler runtime cooperation I think um, the runtime system has a lot of interesting dynamic information and that can be combined with aggressive and uncon unconventional compiler analyses, and that these two things are really complementary, can exploit their strengths. So that's it. Thanks. So there are any, uh, any other? On the analysis <laughs> slides. Did you find, yeah. back in the first half of the time. Yeah, yeah, I know. You it's, find, <laughs> it's tough. Did you find that changing where your compiler phase operated with respects to inlining changed behavior at all, or did your inner procedural, was, you know, was it stable enough with your summaries? 
Well, we are running our analysis after inlining. So that certainly helps um, because it, it, it does take some of the pressure off the inner procedural analysis to come up with. So for example, things like a lot of constructors are inline and that makes the creation of those objects visible in the context where they're used. A lot of small container methods are inlined. That makes that. In fact, in the paper, we show the results if you just turn off the inner procedural analysis, com analysis completely. And it's not a disaster by any means. It still works really well, even if it's just inner procedural. Well, part of the reason for that is that um, if you think about it, if you create an object, it's not going to be very long before you store that object somewhere, right? So in terms of scope, you don't need a lot of scope to see that. Yeah? Again, back in the first one, uh, what was the, the, the approximate cost of the extra analysis for the collocation? Yeah. yeah. You know, cause that, I guess that was subtracted out, you'd sit and pre-compile it, so... That's right, so that's not included in the cost. Right. So it's, it's about... Um, so we incorporated it into the uh, the Jikes RVM optimizing compiler. It adds about a 10%, maybe somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, it's we tried it out in the JIT environment, and it's not uh, it's not terrible. But because the JIT is compiling so few methods, you don't really get to see a lot of the connectivity that's going on in the program. Um, it's really a lot better for the analysis to see as much of the program as it can. So we've sort of thought of this analysis more in terms of maybe a load time, an, uh, a load time optimization, or possibly this could even be done in the Java to bytecode compiler by somehow instrumenting the bytecodes or passing information about connectivity through. If you do that, then you're putting information about generations into the bytecode. Well, not really. You're just putting information about connectivity into the bytecode, which is sort of intrinsic in the program, really. I think you could change the runtime system to get to get that behavior. <clears throat> But just taking one of the benchmarks like expect JPB. Mm -hmm. You've got numbers there for the difference it made to the GC, the, the collection times and so on. But overall, you know, what, what amount of difference did it make end to end wall yeah. time for the, yeah. the benchmark? So I think I got a, uh, somewhere down here, I got, oh, here's run, runtime system related work. So here's, here's like runtime for Java C. So you know, we're improving garbage collection time, which is only a fraction of runtime already. So even if you were to reduce garbage collection time by 60 or 70 percent, you know, there's sort of a limit. So like for Java C, that might be 4 percent for, for the Gen MS and 8 percent for Gen Copy. Actually, the difference, the reason those are, are different is because, at least in our implementation, co-location for Gen Copy produces better locality in the older space because it takes all of these objects that belong to common data structures, packs them together in the older space. We actually see an improvement in the mutator time as a result of doing that. So, but again, you know, it's sort of limited by the G, how much time you're spending in GC. What, what machine was that on? This is on a Pentium 4, I think a 3.2 gigahertz Pentium 4. There you're seeing an improvement in locality. Yeah, yeah. Which is a little surprising because the cache line says it's not big. Yeah, I think it's, um, I suspect it's a lot of it is strings. Um, you know, getting strings together with the character arrays. Um, but I'm, I'm not certain where that's coming from. We definitely see an improvement in mutator time between those two systems. So let's thank the speaker. Thank you. Could be a ray bucket, actually. What's that? Could be a ray bucket.